And thank you to all the organizers and to all of you uh, for being here. It is a pleasure to, to present Poetry in Mind uh, at Cornell. Um, as often happens, I prepared a lecture that might be a bit long, uh, so please be patient or interrupt me, depending on what you prefer. So this lecture is going to be in three parts. The first section is uh, recapitulating the theoretical argument I'm making about my main concept, that is poetry and mind. Uh, it's a bit abstract, but I believe it's okay to a certain extent. Then I will describe how the book is built and emphasize the role of considering multiple traditions uh, together in order to speak differently about poetry. Uh, with no a priori exclusion in terms of languages, cultures, time periods, or places. Of course, a posteriori you have some exclusions because you cannot speak about everything. But. And finally, as a reward, I hope, I will present to you three uh, brief close readings of texts. And before actually beginning, I, I should say that uh, this line of research also belongs now to a slightly more collective initiative. Uh, between the sciences and the humanities that I'm trying to uh, create, uh, especially with um, my good friend and colleague, Martin Christensen, who is here, with whom I am teaching a, a class um, on uh, cultural cognition and, and the humanities, open to both undergraduate and graduate uh, students this year, and the hope is to offer it every other year. Another initiative in that area is the um, uh, reflexive Minds Humanities Lab that I created in the summer with some of my colleagues and, and students, both undergrads and, and graduates. Um, the Reflexive Minds Humanities Lab is trying to offer a, a space for the kind of research that Poetry and Mind uh, partake in. So we're beginning with the mind. And the mind happens to think but it happens to think differently. The mind is at most a conceptual index for where ideas, reflections, feelings, calculations, perceptions, or reasoning take place. But it could also be understood as a repertoire for such operations, phenomena, or experiences. The mind, then, both refers to a site and to a set. And it seems difficult to take the mental set and site to be completely independent of each other. A mind, as we know, is a brain, but is more than a brain. It includes an embodied neural system that should never be blindly identified with one specific organ, such as the brain, or with the upper regions of the brain. The brain itself is not primarily or exclusively uh, cortical. The so-called lower regions of the brain, the more inner and evolutionary ancient parts of the human brain then also give us emotions, balance, and memories. The enteric nervous systems, that is what we have in the guts, apparently influences our moods quite, quite strongly. So minds are not wholly encapsulated in the heads of individuals. They are also routinely distributed through the emergence of group thinking, but I could make a break if you want to. You're fine. I was speaking about group thinking, so that's just an example. Uh, so our minds are also routinely distributed through the emergence of group thinking, partially externalized to blocks of their environment, uh, papers and pens, books, laptops, screens, and uh, other processes. And they are potentially changed through ex exchange. The centripetal force of processes leading to neural appropriation or leading back to neural appropriation cannot conceal the concurrent and centrifugal impetus of the mind. Then I'm making a distinction between thinking and thought, trying to argue that thinking is neither reduced nor reducible to thought. And it's not only a question of action, thinking, and out outcome thought. It's more complicated than that. And there I'm trying to complicate things a bit further by making a distinction between cognition, this term that gained uh, traction um, way beyond uh, its philosophical origin, by contrasting cognition with intellection. 
let us use the word in the category of cognition for mental operations that could be automated, automated and produced according to common rules. While cognitive processes might fail, they seek equilibrium thus tending to be relatively stable, durable, consistent and transparent, relatively. Intelligent there would refer to the differential and variable performance of thinking being created ad hoc. The uh, intellective is transient and often singular, thus resisting automation. The cognitive defects of mental acts, when they lack stability, when they avoid standard consistence, arise through opacity or become simply blocked. Those defects strengthen the advent and the imprint of intellection. Intellection is bypassing cognition, which means that it passes through cognition, in a sense. I suggest there is an excess of and an excess to cognition due to the material channels uh, it has to go through, those material channels being uh, human verbal language, neural synapses, social prescription, and so on. While these excess to and of cognition is often neutralized, it never completely disappears, and it shapes our thoughts more than once. The intellective is a possible name for the productive undoing of cognition, qua cognition, as cognition. And it points toward the potential journey of ideas going beyond cognition after and before computation. This latter operation paving the way for virtual intellection. Again, in a nutshell, that's the intellective space thinking beyond cognition book that I gave you. Thousands of experiments in brain imagery show one thing beyond what they seek to demonstrate, that variability affects our thoughts. No two individuals have the exact same embodied brain, as we know, nor do they use it in the exact same manner, and I too, in my own thinking, in my own thinking will differ from myself. Across comparable populations, patterns of similarity do appear. This is why cognitive science with neuroimagery can, can happen. But a logical temptation is to simply discount everything that is not common, and that is basically uh, where many uh, practitioners of uh, mainstream neuroscience would situate themselves today, even though things are changing. And in the meantime, I want to be slightly provocative here. In the meantime, lots of humanists continue to celebrate what I would consider to be a, a standardized concept of diversity. I would like to say that we do not that variability is not the full extent of what there is, but it is not a marginal error either that you could simply set aside. We do not think in spite of or against it. We just think with it, sometimes through it. Every one of us, and much more obviously all of us together, which is what is happening today, when we try to coordinate ourselves through any intellectual exchange, are part of that. This means that what we could call a cognitive regime and an intellective regime would relate to slightly different things. The cognitive regime would try to unfold thought on itself, while the intellective would attempt to unfold it through thinking. The intellective space is where a mind might seek to go beyond the limitations of the given, of decidability, of computability, etc. And if cognition emerges from the properties of the mind, intellection, I contend, emerges from that emergence, and then is doomed to be further transcribed at an operational level, at the cognitive level. But transcription is no equation, so we cannot simply forget one part of the dispositive. Let's imagine, it's just an image, it's not a theory as such, let's imagine that the mind is a geometrical object, and if it's a geometrical object, it's, here it is. It is multidimensional. I could show you the other slide afterwards if you want, because I forgot it. Um, so it is not wrong to focus on the mind as a one dimensional object rather than adopting a broader view, but it is probably and possibly poor or deliberately simplifying are congruent to specific goals. Those goals could be pedagogic, strategic, epistemic. Let's take the idea of a zero-dimensional mind, which would be a kind of ideal immaterial point. You would say that doesn't exist. Well, maybe that doesn't exist, but that's very close to what 
René Descartes is uh, alluding to at the extreme tip of the methodic doubt that he is introducing in uh, his meditations. When he speaks about the thing that is thinking, if you want to translate this way, res cogitans, the thing that is thinking, that might have no body, no world, no God, and no place to be. So it would be a kind of zero-dimensional. Uh, of course, Cartesian geometry is close to that. As I guess you, you, you made the inference here. So there, this kind of zero-dimensional mind works uh, as the very intent of thought. Descartes contrasts that with what he calls the extended thing, res extensa. The extended thing is, for him, a body where the mind could be. Um, and the punctual image of the mind may have never been other than some intended and transitional fiction for Descartes. But it's still, it was there in the first cognitive paradigm from the 1960s and 70s where most players in the uh, emerging field of cognitive studies were essentially downplaying what they would call the material role of the hardware in the advent of thought. So it's not a completely, completely forgotten idea. More recent propositions certainly have added one axis, which is the extent, the body that you have there, and suggested to approach the mind to the extent of its necessary embodiment. Uh, so that's the one dimension I was speaking about. You hear sometimes about the extended mind hypothesis, which is gaining traction uh, within cognitive science and beyond, where the mind is a kind of bi-dimensional object. There you address the ecological situation of intelligent agents downloading parts of their noetic functions to a peripheral apparatus. The intellective share that I'm trying to speak about hints uh, at extension beyond extendedness. So you have the extended mind, and, and I call that extendedness, and extension, through the eventful co-elaboration of transient thinking. And the fourth dimension of time, as in other models, deals, of course, with the gradual aspect of ideas, since we know that ideas are being assembled or constructed, that they appear, and that they sink. They also deal with the tenability of what the same time could be to us. And I have this uh, kind of recapitulation there. Human verbal language is a, uh, a very powerful organon there. Organon in the Greek sense that is both an organ and also a way of organizing things, a kind of uh, well-ordered set. A very powerful organon that makes us think differently. Human verbal language guarantees cognitive routines through syntactic rules. It disseminates knowledge, it emphasizes logical sets, it enforces social prescriptions. Words, the words that we use, create zones of convergence and attract our basins for ideations that order our stream of thought. And you know that in uh, humans, attention disorders often go with weakened uh, verbal abilities, and conversely, uh, non-human apes having some language, whom we could call the languaged apes, uh, like the chimpanzees and bonobos uh, raised by Sue Savage Rambo, who use uh, English and specific symbols, reach a new mental level that is not confined to the added possibility of, for affective expression that is being granted by the organon of language. And that's the last book I published in, the, in, in English, Diaries on the Human Ape, with uh, so Savage Rambo. I'm not trying to push for another chat in the stats, but it's a very interesting topic. The paradox is this. Because human speech has to be granular, open-ended, flexible, and opaque enough to lend itself to possibly unlimited and unexpected usages, because it appears as a proliferating and largely autonomous entity, it is also the source of so-called noise within communication, and it operates, but it also differentially performs. It bootstraps cognition while betraying what I call the cognitive regime, that is this unfolding of thought on itself. It is through the iterable performance of cognition that intellection could arise, which means that the rules and the disciplines of human language may be the unexpected paths leading to the intellective space. And that's where I'm moving toward poetry. 
The, the Greek poiesis uh, is the name I retain to speak of creative mental responses to the uh, uncomputable, and especially as they pertain to intellection with language. Poiesis, as many uh, terms in classical Greek, could mean all of this, fabrication, creation, poetry, poem, and even magical procedure. Not formulas so much, but procedure. Poetry is a verbal art that both extensively explores and shapes intensively the potentialities of poiesis. That doesn't imply that all intellection is poetic or that the whole of poetry uh, is intellective, but the mental experience of poetic events relies on noetic extension. So you have the cognitive block, but it's being performed differently and bypassed through the intellective. So as such, poetry expands and changes our minds. Not only or not exclusively or not primarily the content of what we think, but the way the mind is working, usually. To say it differently, what is happening to us with, poem, with poems challenges what we believe we know about cognition. It eloquently shows that there are more than rules and operations in thinking, but also that such excess can only derive and derail from routines, patterns, automation. So we need to have this kind of uh, more, com more complicated uh, perspective there. Poetry brings forth a kind of re-automation of language through sets of specific prosodic, lexical and syntactic rules, and I'm not going to do a lot of prosody and metrics today, so I hope you're not too disappointed. Um, so a kind of re-automation of language that de-automatizes our banal understanding of meaning, grammar, or logic. And I wrote somewhere that the poetic is incommensurable to the algorithmic that nonetheless allows it. So when I'm using terms such as algorithmic, cognition, automation, those, these vocabulary might be a bit uh, outside of the realm of literary criticism to, to many of you. Um, but at the same time, you might feel, in what I just said, for, some, for those of you who read me, you, you know that even more, you might feel that I'm also a bit critical, a bit critical, of some methods pertaining to the digital humanities, and especially of what I uh, consider to be an undue emphasis on data that would not be articulated with an understanding of the different regimes of thought and thinking. But I'm still using automation I'm still using an algorithm, and it could sound uh, new, in an, paradoxically new in an age of computational communication and methods, but the ideas underlying the diversity of such theories have been with us for at least centuries, way, beyond, way before the invention of the computer. I'm, just, I'm not going backwards too much, but I'm going up to the 17th and 19th century, when you had scholars who proposed, British scholars, I don't know if there is a relation there, who proposed to understand poetic line formation as a merely algorithmic uh, production of templates. The key example for both uh, John Peter and John Clark was the classical dactylic hexameter, which is the meter you find in Homer, but their main target was uh, Virgil and the Aeneid in particular. So in the 1670s, John Peter published a treatise entitled Artificial Versifying, designing a largely automated rule of operation, that's his word, rule of operation. This rule of operation is really what we would call an algorithm. It's not implemented in the machine, but it's clearly algorithmic. Uh, a rule of operation that would dig a lexical database in Latin uh, and would generate either iambic pentameters or dactylic hexameters uh, so I'm reading one uh, dactylic hexameter produced by this uh, rule of operation. So in Latin, it's tristia fata tibi producun sidera prawa, which gives your sad fate brings forth pernicious stars. That's my translation, but no. Um, so that's the kind of poetry you end up with. And in 1845, John Clark implemented a different algorithm, but similar in style, uh, in a machine, so that's the machine that you have here. Uh, for qu quite some years now, the museum where the machine is held uh, claims that it will be renewed very soon, but it's, apparently it's not done yet. Um, so John Clark finished the machine, uh, producing similar lines, hexameters, uh, but in one minute, 
and uh, with some bonus to the sound of the British national anthem. Uh, so I'm just quoting one. Uh, one is Horrida sponsa reis promutunt tempora densa, which we could translate by the horrid spouses of things promise dense times. So end of quote. That's another uh, generated, uh, another line generated by uh, the machine. S True, both Peter and Clark cut corners. I mean, their lines are always six words long, and they repeat a small set of predetermined metrical structures. I cannot show you the detail, but it's a very small set of uh, predetermined uh, metrical structures. So that severely limits the power of the endeavors. All algorithmic descriptions are not born equal. But if we let that, if we cast that aside, I believe that more importantly, rather than saying, oh, we could do a much better algorithm today. Uh, more importantly, the main error of both Clark and Peter, and that's an error that is now repeated over and over by many proponents of uh, computerized poetry, consisted in seeing only the cognitive part of the poetic operation. It exists, but that's not the only thing. To use the word of uh, Giambattista Marino, uh, an Italian poet from the late, very late Renaissance, in matters of poetry, that's coming from a, a letter he wrote to a friend of his, uh, la vera regola è saper rompere le regole a tempo e luogo. The true rule is to know how to break the rules in time and place, end of quote. Poetic events cannot be resumed to the rules they take exception to. They are not outlandish. They are not mystical. They don't come from nowhere. They bear a relation to the routinization of mental operations, but not only do they deform them, they also open up new paths to our minds and possibly to our souls, if we want to recycle that term. In the current climate of defunding the study of literature to the benefit of applied technical sciences, there is, I believe, some urgency to establish that poetry both modifies and expands how and what we think. A war is being waged against the intellective extension of the mind. That's not how it is being phrased, usually, of course. But that's what I'm telling you here. And against the potentialities of noetic creation. This war is at once commercial, theoretical, and political. By becoming exclusively or even mainly computational or bureaucratic, depending on the term you want to, to choose, the humanities as a field of inquiry would lose any right to be by believing in social engineering through the means of literature rather than its, in, uh, its transformative potentialities, critical theory makes itself subservient to the laws of the land it should contest. And by importing relatively randomly technical tools from the quantitative sciences or half understood results into humanistic research, one could become ensnared in unadapted technicalities while ratifying the unidimensional mind. By putting the emphasis on prerequisite determinations, literary criticism and theory miss the raison d'être of their own objects while contributing willy-nilly to the goal of reducing mental capabilities and the livability of life. So what we need now, of course, you, for those of you who know me, you know that I'm not uh, adverse to uh, grandiloquent pronouncements. So what we need now, if we ever wish to renew the study of literary thinking, is to appropriate scientific descriptions without identifying them with procedures or with tricks and without, without being bounded by them. So the book here, Poetry and Mind, is uh, a case of undisciplined research in the sense that it combines cognitive science with literary criticism, philology with theory, and the analytic tradition of philosophy with the broader conception of philosophy. That's me speaking. Uh, what people would say in, uh, in the analytic front would say that the rest of philosophy is continental. But, so this, but I'm trying to engage in a kind of uh, contradictory dialogue with uh, everyone here. The book also reacts to the current standardization of academic writing in adopting and possibly altering the poetics of a discursive subgenre that was uh, inspired by Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. The recourse to a method of exposition in Wittgenstein's first book that was uh, aimed at anchoring thought in the most stringent constraints of linear rationality can only be judged, I mean, it's a bit paradoxical, sure, can only be judged in relation to the overall argument about the intellective excess of and to cognition. In other terms, uh, Tractatus Poetico Philosophicus neither excuses nor ridicules 
the ordering of epideictic thought, it just does and undoes it. At its very beginning, Poetry and Mind is at odds with Wittgenstein's point of arrival uh, in the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. You know that that was just the point of arrival for that book. Um, Wittgenstein went somewhere else. So famous Proposition 7, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. It's better in German, but that's the usual translation in English. And Proposition 0 of my Tractatus is what one cannot compute, thereof one must speak. So in the book, you have uh, propositions. I gave you a kind of summary of the first part of the book. Most of the book consists in, in uh, exploring those features of poetry. Not defi definitional trait, but features of poetry. Uh, there are 14 of them. They are grouped uh, here. You, The first three ones that you have, I'm not going to uh, go into details for all of, of those uh, different um, features, but the, the third one relate to the fact that I'm not trying to historicize poetry. In a sense, I'm trying to dehistoricize poetry, which doesn't mean that I have no interest in the historical. I have deep interest in that, but I don't think that the historical is determining what we could call poetry. Then the second set, uh, so that's where poetry, in my opinion, is uh, possibly, is very widespread, to say the least, and possibly universal among societies. The second part, uh, the four propositions uh, that you have with the letter B, um, deal with semantics, with competence, with the fact that Within poetry, you operate within lang one language, but you go beyond the limits of one language and possibly beyond the limits of language. And it deals with imagery. Uh, unfortunately, it's often the case that people understand poetry to be mainly about using the right metaphor. I mean, that's not clearly, that's not where I am, but I'm trying to um, give a different uh, understanding of, uh, provide a different understanding of that. Then we have those two propositions that I'm going to speak about a little bit because I'm trying to re to give a new description of regular or, or normative poetry across centuries and across languages. So I'm going to speak about that in a few seconds. Then the other the other sets of propositions you have one is more technical. That's the D uh, letter. Uh, so it's about reflexivity, compressibility. Uh, prosody and the way a uh, prosodic algorithm is being created and then undone. And it, has, and it deals with uh, formal logic. So that's the uh, cognitive science hardcore uh, part of the, uh, of the book. And I'm ending with uh, the idea that uh, poetry creates detachable, movable, and livable signification for psychological selves and the multiplication of the selves. And uh, that it suggests thinking experiments for the unthinkable. I'm speaking a bit more about that later on. So the scope of the book is very broad and very comparative. It encompasses dozens of different traditions, almost 100 actually, from all continents, from ancient times to the contemporary era. And I use both uh, references. Uh, I use references to both written literature and oral, or even signed literature, which is not oral, but not written uh, necessarily. Some 20 to 30 close readings of poems uh, illustrate and modified aspects of the propositions. I will present to you a few of them. Uh, I try to move uh, in between Western and non-Western authors, from Homer to uh, Petrarch, but also from Marie de France to Emily Dickinson, from saint to Aimé Césaire, from Bachot to Ezra Pound, etc. Trying to develop reflections on African, Oceanian, and uh, indigenous American oral and written poems and songs as well. You have a few pages on contemporary lyrics, uh, opera librettos, rap, and rock songs. It's tiny, but it's there. And postcolonial literature is equally commented upon. I believe that things appear differently when you compare lots of traditions, not only the main traditions, or what is supposed to be the group of the main traditions, but lots of traditions. And here, my approach is, in a sense, is similar to the case of contemporary research within linguistics, where work on much vaster and less Eurocentric sets of languages yielded very different results, especially uh, results that are at odds with uh, uh, generative linguistics and uh, Noam Chomsky's hypothesis on universal grammar uh, 
particular. Um, I'm not the first one to compare uh, different uh, traditions. It's true, however, that most comparative work on poetry uh, relies on Indo-European languages with uh, sometimes an addition of uh, Semitic languages and some Asiatic uh, traditions, uh, Chinese and Japanese especially. Um, in the European sphere, as a kind of construct, you have Jonathan Keller's uh, theory of the lyric that takes a more uh, historically uh, grounded and uh, geographically grounded approach. You might think of some scholars of the past, such as the linguist Roman Jakobson, uh, who was working really uh, with Slavic languages, Indo-European languages in general, and Hebrew in particular, uh, Henri Mechonik might be mentioned to some extent, or uh, the Israeli scholar Rovan Tsur, whose name is not very famous in, in the US, but once the first time I was teaching in, in, uh, at Tsinghua in, in, in China, I, I introduced the name of Rovan Tsur, saying, in all probability, you don't know him very well, but everybody in the class knew his, his work very well, so you have very different uh, understandings of what matters. I mean, Ruven Tsur, Israeli uh, thinker who um, coined the term cognitive poetics, which I wouldn't reclaim, but that. But those are relatively local descriptions, even though they are broad. Uh, the only comparable essay in terms of scope with Poetry in Mind would be Nigel Fab's What is Poetry, uh, a book published in 2015. But in Fab's book, uh, a, you only find technical aspects about poetry, and there is no literary interpretation that's by design in his case. And B, uh, I believe he's limited by his uh, wrong conjecture about the fabrication of poetic lines that comes from his uh, faith in uh, Chomskyan linguistics. So um, I'm just showing you a, a good example of what happens when one compares dozens of languages, traditions, and corpora. Regular poetry, and of course there is not only normative and regular poetry, even though when you take poetry as, as a whole, you will find the formation of poetic lines uh, according to rules and norms is pretty dominant. Uh, regular poetry is extremely widespread. The usual description, you can find that everywhere in encyclopedias, Wikipedia, etc. The usual description coming from the metrical pattern one finds in most European languages will tell you that meter is paramount and that the regular sequence of a meter depends on either stress or vocalic duration or syllabic counts, counting or combination of such concerns. And you, I mean, in English, in German, in French, in Italian, you, it works pretty, pretty well. Usually you have a kind of odd suggestion added to that. Uh, that is, people will also say that there is the existence of another different system that relies on repetition and parallelism. It's mainly in order to make sense of what we can understand to be uh, poetry in the Torah and in some paleo-Semitic texts. And some scholars will argue that uh, the rhyme is often constitutive of the well-ordered line, but <coughs> something we could discuss. So the description works well in many traditions. It even works with uh, traditions that are very far away from that. Uh, for instance, Vietnamese poetry uh, you know, uh, works quite well. But it doesn't capture what is happening in many American indigenous languages. It doesn't capture what is happening in uh, Aboriginal poetry. It doesn't capture many of the things that are also happening within our more Indo-European uh, corpora. It conceals lots of elements that are an integral part of even canonical European poetry, such as uh, imitative harmonies. I'm going to speak a bit more about that. That is when the sound or the rhythm and or the rhythm of what is being described is expressed through the fabric of the verse. Uh, it does a poor job with alliterations or mandatory lexical choices. Or we could also think of calligrams. Calligrams are not the uh, late oddities of avant-garde abnormalities appearing in the 20th century. Actually, they are recorded in many different traditions. A poem about a cup in the form of a cup you find that over millennia as well. And you have, it's difficult to say that here the metrical pattern is what creates the cup. So I'm proposing a different take based on the uh, analysis of more than 100 traditions where you have poetic regulation being uh, going into two different directions. 
one direction in regular poetry is based on systems of repetition, and you might know that Gerard Manley Hopkins, when he was an undergraduate student, intuited that. And Jacobson quotes that more than once. And there, suddenly, meters, as well as parallelism, or sound repetitions are branching off uh, from that systematic. So that works for the languages we are more familiar with, I would say. But another branching, equally respectable, uh, consists in what I call linguistic reorganization through enhanced iconicity and or through an organized change in lexical, syntactic, or morphological rules that create the impression of elevated language. So the description I'm providing is based on those formal analysis. Uh, of course, the real description is that. I mean, that's one system. Uh, so you see this iterative system part where you have iteration and meter uh, on one hand and the other. And all of those different categories could branch off uh, and, and create other sub subcategories in just a kind of partial rendition of it. The other direction, linguistic reorganization, uh, also happens in such a way. So that's, I cannot show you both of them, and I'm not sure you can really read them very well, but that's what I'm trying to show there. And if we take those two directions, four uh, directions coming from those two, uh, you have a powerful convergence in terms of norms, uh, as well as a very complex combinatory system, since any trait could be combined with any other feature that would create a new model of organization. So you can recombine everything. Uh, one of the striking results, I would say, is that what is absolutely key in one area could be a mere option in another area. For instance, um, the traditional Amharic poetry in Ethiopia absolutely needs to be a, a, about a very sophisticated pun or a kind of double entendre, or sometimes you have three layers, sometimes four layers. You have poems that could be read in three to four different, uh, uh, with three to four different meanings. Clearly, that's not an addition. That's really what constitutes regular poetry in Amharic. Uh, but you could find equivalence in, in other uh, languages, clearly, where, they, where that would not play the role of a norm. The same thing with alliterations, for instance, that could create the normativity or not. Same thing for rhymes that are so important in some traditions and absolutely non-existent in others. So rules are uh, also unevenly enforced in time and space. So I just, um, to sum up where, I'm, where I am here, um, the intent is to show, on one hand, that the normativity of poetry, for lack of well-equipped comparisons, has often been approached in a very parochial uh, view, uh, way. And two, that all these rules that you can see, that we can describe, that we can endlessly describe, are not an end, but only the means toward poetic events. No, now, only a good description of the regularities will allow us to show how poems are able to bypass ordinary limits of thought. And I'm trying to uh, wrap up with three uh, short, close readings of three different texts here. And because I thought you would need to have the text with you, I prepared handouts rather than showing you the... Um, so it's one, one sheet of paper for every one of you. Yeah. The first example uh, is drawn from the classical Greek corpus to famous uh, moment for classicists. And it will illustrate uh, one key feature of poetry in relation to maximal and dynamic systems of meaning. So what you have as proposition B2 here, poetry maximizes and dynamizes semantics. The second example is taken from a linguistic corpus documenting a, a Khoisan language, Bushman language, that is now extinct, and we'll see that iconicity seemed to work as a normative function, so that's re that relates to uh, proposition C2 here, that poetry is regulated through linguistic reorganization. And we will end up 
if I'm not too long, with a 20th um, uh, century American text uh, by Gertrude Stein that could show us how a thinking experiment could be created. So I'm beginning with Sophocles, and I hope that most of you have uh, been able to get the text. Um, so that's the famous choral old uh, within a Sophocles tragedy named Antigone, uh, ode devoted to mankind. And it, this ode is built on semantic oscillation. The, the, first word, uh, the first words of the ode are polatadaina, which you could translate as there are many fearful or dangerous or marvelous or skillful things, depending on your options. And among those things, the superlative one, the most, uh, the deina terra, the deina terra uh, things are uh, mankind. Uh, mankind is both terrible, especially terrible, and terrific. And the rest of the chorus deploys words associated either with peril on one hand or with ingenuity on the other hand, including a few other polyvalent terms, uh, such as the ones I'm listing in your handout. Mechane, for instance, means either ruse or machine. It even means the machine on which the gods, uh, on which the actors playing the gods appear on stage or above the stage. Krate, uh, having power or showing for seizing power. And the line sums it up by saying that mankind, I quote, sometimes moves toward evil, other times toward good, end of quote. And the term that I'm translating as moving here, um, coming back to that, is erpei, the last term in Greek. These considerations, all of these considerations, are being opened up by one word, deina, terrible and terrific, that rules over 40 lines with no definite solution in view. Sophocles, in the whole ode, maintains the semantic bifurcation of Dana by exploiting the dyadic structure of the choral ode, and an, an ode in, in a tragedy is made of a strophe, and an, a strophe and an antistrophe, and you have half of the chorus uh, singing one thing and the other half responding. So it's always a dyadic model that is built in uh, the tragedy. But Sophocles is using that, in my opinion, uh, to strengthen his argument. And he has even recourse to juxtaposed antithesis, such as the ones I'm mentioning here. So you, you have no word between pantoporos, aporos, which means resourceful, resourceless, or between hypsipolis, apolis, high on the city, banned from the city. While listening to the text, if you're uh, moving yourself to the uh, Greek theater, uh, while listening to the text, we stick to one region of the semantic specter. If we do that, if we just stick with one region of what Dana means, then the next sentence is urging us to move away from that area only and to constantly describe a movement between poles. Such semantic bistability, uh, in the sense that kind of slightly mathematical sense there, is akin to what happens with the duck rabbit or the, the, uh, or the rabbit duck in the realm of uh, visual perception. I guess you, you see both the duck and the rabbit and the duck and the rabbit. And that's exactly what is happening with Dana. Here, I, I would not uh, choose the term ambiguity. I would not choose the term undecidability. Uh, because I believe that Sophocles neither advocates gray zone or relativism that would be for ambiguity. Nor does he suspend decision, which is the strong sense of uh, undecidability. He is rather asking us to consider two attractors in the same space rather than at the same time. I would even suggest that the chorus members who were dancing when they were performing may have danced uh, alternately by going to the left and going to the right uh, in the line, sometimes moves toward evil, other times moves toward good. The verb erpo means to go, but also to walk slowly. So you can even see a possible dance. Um, tragic dances, as far as we can know, uh, were often mimetic in, in nature. They were, so that's why I'm throwing that conjecture. Uh, Boustrophed on writing, which you have here, I mean, when you, instead of writing from left to right or right to left, you are alternating from uh, right to left and left to right from one line to the other. Uh, Boustrophed on writing uh, was still practiced in classical Athens. And it was another widespread material structure that could help specializing verbal bestability as it occurs in the mind. 
the dynamics of semantics is being performed in these chorus, and it requires uh, to move uh, past the cognitive stability of meaning distributions if we want to embrace what is being said instead of pinpointing it through uh, reduction. So I'm moving to a very strange text um, for me, um, coming from the Bushman literature. And that's where I'm trying to add a few words about iconicity as a poetic form. Putative proto-music, principally made of vocalization, pitch, and humming, could have influenced sound iconicity uh, in poems and songs. One might speculate that vocables, ideophones, and onomatopoeias are the remnants of uh, something else, including why not a kind of uh, proto-music, previous art form uh, that would have been encapsulated within linguistic artifacts. You might think of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his hypothesis about what he called musilangage, musilangue, musilanguage, uh, and this kind of transitional moment leading from that musy language uh, to language as such. In any case, whatever you, you want to choose in terms of explanation, um, the fact that you would have so many words, especially in, in, more, in some languages, that are iconic uh, is um, opening um, the way for a kind of reuse uh, within poetry. And it is precisely because human language is neither essentially mimetic nor absolutely arbitrary with regards to the, to the science that it could use uh, those iconic exceptions that may be poetically assembled. And such reorganization implies a vast understanding of the powers of meaningful communication. So I'm moving toward this uh, tiny, tiny poem, tiny song. Uh, coming from uh, an extinct uh, civilization of, uh, belonging to the San uh, uh, group. Um, two anthropologists, Wilhelm Bleck and, uh, and Lloyd, have collected in the late 19th century uh, many tales and uh, many songs from uh, different speakers who were the last ones to speak their language. Uh, many of those stories are about the animal people who would later become beasts, leaving to the early Bushmen the task to be the only humans. That's what most of those stories tell. Unsurprisingly, stories or songs are often presented by the informants in this collection that has been largely rediscovered over the last 20 years as having been taught in the past by the animal people themselves to the ancestors of the sun. Uh, so I'm quoting one here, and that's the brief song of the fleeing blue crane, and it goes like this, and I'm trying to do my best to do justice to the text. Um, so it would go like this. Which is translated as a splinter of stone which is white, a splinter of stone which is white, a splinter of stone which is white. Asked to explain the meaning, the informant, named uh, Cabo, said that, I quote, the bird sings about its head, which is something of the shape of a stone knife or splinter, which has white feathers, end of quote. And that's where the scholars stop when they uh, introduce that text. But what they missed, I believe, is the fact that the original text, as you may have heard it uh, a little bit, produces an imitative harmony of the blue train skull. So I found on a contemporary website a description of that call in English. And the call is des described as which is quite close to And the poeticity of the brief sun lyrics results from a self-referential alignment between evocative and onomatopoeias, and you find lots of vocables such as ra or ru in many other texts, uh, and visual description. So simplicity here is deceptive. And clearly, the neglect of iconicity as a potential poetic rule coming from the dominant tradition of Indo-European poetry made the anthropologists quite unable to hear what in this song is music to my ears and to yours, I hope, even though none of us and nobody uh, on earth speaks uh, a language that is now completely gone. Last example with uh, Gertrude Stein's short piece. Uh, it's one of the short pieces that she writes in 1911, in the 1910s, and that she will collect into the uh, 1934 Portraits and Prayers. You have the beginning and the end of that text. So I'm just reading the beginning. One, one, one. 
There are many of them. There are very many of them. There are many of them. Each one of them is one. Each one is one. There are many of them. Each one is one. There are many of them. There are very many of them. Each one is one. There are many of them. So throughout, throughout the few pages of the poems, Stein repeats the oscillating multiplicity and unicity, unicity of each one. And that poem is called Galerie Lafayette. She's the name of the general store. But sometimes she will write, I mean, she used different spellings. And so, sometimes she would write an S at the end of Galerie and an S at the end of Lafayette to give kind of wider, wider impression of plurality. So you have the multiplicity and unicity of each one, each customer, each gallery, each item, each one. And it repeats her, and she repeats her own repetitions in a way that performs the one that is one and many. And so you have the conclusive paragraphs. I shouldn't read it, but I will uh, read it, however, because it's, it's a beautiful one. Each one is one and is that one, and is especially that one and is that a special one, and is accustomed to being that one. Is used to being that one, is quite used to being that one. Is very well accustomed to be that one. Is suddenly very well accustomed to be that a special one. Is very well accustomed to be especially that one. Is very well accustomed to be the one that one is being. Is one that is being one, and each one is one. And there are many of them, and each one is any one, and any one is one, is an a special one. And each one is one, and there are many of them, and each one is any one of them, and any one of them is an special one. And each one is one, each one is the one that is being that one, and each one is one. And each one is being the one each one is being, and each one is one, and each one is being each one, and each one is being the one each one is being, and each one is one is the one that one is being. Each one is being one, is one being the one that one is being. Each one is one, there are many of them. Each one is one. Each one is one being the special one that one is being." End of quote. There are um, undeniably algorithmic processes that move the text through recursive specifications, branching integration. And that we could call that its machinery. But when we read the whole poem, we lose track. So the, you have the machinery, but we just lose track. Lose track of time, or of what was said before, of what we are, if we are one, and there are many of us, one that is being one, that one, or anyone that is used to being that one, etc. Yet, we think, and I say that we think intellectively, the oneness of the multiple and the multiplicity of the one. Topics that we can only philosophically touch upon, and maybe wrongly so, if one abides by Carnap's destruction of metaphysics. And we we think the oneness of the multiple and the multiplicity of the one because we are, in fact, making our way through the prose poem. As I read the piece, I also prolong some sentences and I bifurcate propositions in the way I just did a few seconds ago. I am beginning to make mine a noetic device that is built within language and that is additionally built within English. For instance, that that would both be a demonstrative, that one, and the relative pronoun, the one that one is being, or that one would be a number, one, 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 a pronoun, the one that one, and a quasi-adjective is one, as well as the structures of the present progressive allowing the end is being, all of those uh, are linguistic properties of one idiom, English, that have no systematic equivalence in other languages. When I presented that, uh, that text to the Collège de France in, in France, I, I admit that I didn't try even to translate that. The thinking experiment goes back to itself. Is it one and the same if it only occurs here in American English? Are we thinking what is, what is to be, what it is to be one, what it is to be one being one, only through the transient and local experience of a set of idiomatic utterances? Here, through poetic notions rather than philosophical concepts, we think what we cannot grasp cognitively or even contain within the disciplined positivity of well-ordered languages. In other terms, what one what cannot compute, one must poetize. Thank you. I'm sorry I've been long. Propaganda poetry has to be heard as much as read. Right. <laughs>
really. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, are you open to questions? If, if sure, people, sure. I mean, a people are up to it. I'm up to it. Could you comment on what the current trend toward Twitter accounts might mean for uh, poetic expression? <laughs> um, let's imagine I'm giving you the uh, optimistic answer. We have a new tool that helps us communicating differently and through Twitter we will be able to find a way to create new normativities and new ways of undoing those normativities in which case we will produce unheard of poems that were previously unheard of. So that's the optimistic answer. I don't believe in that for one second, but I had to, to say it, I assume. Uh, I mean, it's also Cornell. We have Cornell Tech, the Cornell Tech campus. We, so we, we, we like some of it. Uh, I believe, even though Twitter is not, in my opinion, the main problem there, but what goes with, uh, so, with the social media and what goes with the uh, use of identity-based perforations of monologues, that, which is the dominant form of the social media. It, it doesn't have to be the dominant form of the social media. It's just what it is now. This goes contrary to uh, dialogue. This goes contrary to the idea of bypassing cognitive routines. This, this goes, I mean, this has been engineered in such a way that it would participate in what I described to be the war against intellection and the war against the poetic expansion of, of the mind. So it's not the fault of technology as, as such. I mean, humans have programmed it. I mean, you have humans behind, behind it. Uh, some people have a huge investment in uh, capturing and seizing the way we talk and the way we change through words on the social media and on other platforms. And the, the direction that has been uh, implemented so far in the dominant direction is clearly not in favor of what I'm trying to describe. Thank you for your question. Yes. I was wondering if in translation, if you think that translators, say a poet as translator, if the responsibility to staying close to the music of the original text, if that's found more often in trying to adhere to the form of the original or finding the same music in the current culture in which the poet is writing and translating. Makes no sense. Oh, right? That makes sense, that <laughs> makes complete sense. Um, in one of the uh, features I'm, I'm trying to uh, explore in the book, you have the issue of compressibility, which is a reference to uh, compression of information also within cognition or within information science and computers, et cetera. Um, so the, a certain idea about translation consists in saying that things could be compressed to, to a good extent. Um, what I believe poetry is doing, and I'm not the first one saying that in, in that area, even though people usually don't use compressibility, but what poetry is doing is also trying to enhance the level of untrans untranslatability. At the same time, poems are being translated, and they have been translated all the time. So we can translate some things. I don't... Um, it's a minority position. Today, it was not a minority position maybe four or five centuries ago um, that you would need, for instance, if you were to translate into English, if you were to translate Homer into English, you would need to have well-ordered lines the way uh, you have them in, 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 in English. So you would, not re, you would not keep the sounds or the specific uh, effects uh, of rhythm in, in the original, but you would find what would be deemed to be an acceptable cultural equivalent with the idea that usually uh, people, um, especially after the 18th century, um, stopped hearing all the sounds that those classical poems were making. And so that's also part of what was lost in translation. Um, it's also the case, what could be, um, Counterintuitive here is that 
free, free verse, in my opinion, is not free. It's just a multiplication of uh, uh, non-free forms. You can just, the freedom is that you can change the rules you work with or you work under. And so if you read Ezra Pound, that's really what he's doing. He's conjuring up all of those non-free forms constantly. So an illusion would be to say it's easier to translate free verse uh, from one language to the, to the other, except that it's much more complicated because if you want to come up with all of those sub-level or subconscious systems of organizations that are being uh, reclaimed through free verse, then it's even more daunting. Um, there is, Baudelaire uh, has translated uh, most of Edgar Allan Poe's uh, short stories, not all of them, but he began at one point translating uh, Edgar Allan Poe's poetry, and he he began translating those poems uh, with Alexandrin, with with usual classical form in, forms in, in French. And he he was not happy with that, so he famously said that you cannot you cannot you should not keep prose normative normative poetry as normative poetry when you move from one language to the other. You should just move to prose, and that. Many things will be lost, but at least you will be able to retain more, which is possible. But that will also come from his own frustration with his uh, uh, experience as a translator. One interesting thing, for instance, is do we keep the word order of a text? I'm coming from a tradition of translation uh, where it was supposed to be paramount. So when I, when I translate from the classical Greek or the, I mean, that's how I've been trained as a classicist. Or from Latin, I, I try to, to retain the uh, word order. But when you move from Chinese to uh, French or Chinese to German, you will have a harder time uh, keeping word order, for instance. So it's, you also need some level of compatibilities between languages. Thanks, Laurent. Sure. That was quite something. Um, and I, I understood very little of it. But I was really interested in, what, in your idea that poetry can change the way we think. But you seem to have a very capacious view of poetry. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm wondering if, like, you know, a poem like Roses are Red, Violets are Blue, um, I don't know the rest, but I, I Like You, is the same thing as a Baudelaire poem. And in which case, you know, the poems that we normally think of or we study are poems, and they're, they're supposedly studied because of their incredible ambiguity, their multiplicity of meaning. Um, and I don't think Baudelaire is the same as Roses are Red, Violets mm -hmm. are Blue. So how would, that, how would that change our way of thinking? So, um, I'm absolutely non-relativistic. So I consider, and I have no shame considering it, I consider that some poems are much better than others and some authors are much more interesting than others. So I have, you know, I'm, you, you, you may know lots of literary uh, scholars who would have a hard time saying it, especially in public. I mean, they would say it after one bottle of wine, but I can even say it when I'm sober. So uh, I agree. <laughs> I agree with you. There are very different things happening depending uh, on the text. What I'm trying to, uh, to work on is this very capacious understanding of poetry. When I'm speaking quite early on in the second part of the book about gradients of competence, uh, it, it, it's precisely, it, it may be the second, uh, it's the first one of the second group, it's the first feature. It, it is, poetry is differentially performed with varying degrees of competence. That means for the reader, that means for the author, that means for the community that is interpreting the text. So the changes the mental changes that will come from reading or writing poetry will not be one and the same depending on those degrees and depending on those gradients. So you will, have, you will be changed more by more challenging or, uh, texts or by texts that <coughs> use with more intensity the features I describe. So it's not everything... Okay, I'm not sure I should say that, but... Um, 
I usually say things I shouldn't say. Um, so I was uh, invited at a, to give a lecture last year at Brigham Young University. Uh, one person appreciates that here in the room, um, in, by the Center for the Humanities. And I presented ideas related to the first half of what I described, but the second half was about what I called the contemporary rarity of, of poetry. Poetry didn't disappear, but it's rarer. And I was relating that to uh, Adorno's uh, famous quote about uh, the absence of poem after Auschwitz, and I was saying it was wrong, but that there was something that was accurate in the sense that there is a higher uh, rarity of, of, of poetry, uh, not because of Auschwitz, but that's a different story. And then I've been really attacked by two colleagues we, we know, two former Cornell PhDs who were telling me, but poetry is everywhere, poetry is on Twitter, poetry is, is uh, this equal and the same everywhere. Both of them are Cornell PhDs with uh, having studied English Lit. They mainly deal with high level, high culture objects, but still, they wanted to make the case that uh, I was excluding poetry in, in my way of presenting that there might be differences. So there are differences, which, which means that the, I'm not, I cannot be in favor of changing the mind if I'm saying that there is one way to change it, and just one way. So depending on the text, depending on how you read it, how you can access it, if you can access it in the original language or through translations, what is the interpretive, uh, interpretative community you are a part of, depending on all of those things, the way you think will not be changed in the same, in the same manner. What? Bad poetry is... Yeah, I'm thinking of Moliere, remember, you know... No, precisely, precisely bad poetry is not exceeding the algorithm. Uh, bad poetry is just maintaining itself at the level of the algorithm. But I'm, I'm not concerned so much with bad poetry. <laughs> That's a decision. Yeah. Uh, do you have time for one more? Okay, so <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much.